Welcome to the Business Mechanic Show. New Year's Eve 2023, moving into 2024. It's a great time to talk about the topic we're going to be on today, which is taking the first step towards leading a high-performing team. We're going to talk about how you can empower and engage your employees like never before. So let's get into it. As an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a manager, steering your team towards peak performance can often feel difficult, highly frustrating. Why? Why don't they just do what they're supposed to do? The key to this challenge is instilling a sense of ownership on your team and accountability with your team. And in this podcast, we'll dive into practical strategies, some education to help you lead your team to embrace their roles fully and drive your team and company success. Let's start by pinpointing the core issue. In the journey to move from manager to leader and effective team management, a common stumbling block is a lack of ownership among your team members. Where does that come from? Why don't they just accept what I'm asking them to do and go do it? There's actually 16 reasons why. 16 reasons why they don't do what you want them to do. And unfortunately, they're all on you. Bad news, but it's a new year. Let's do something about it. We often blame them, but it's not on them. It's on us. And they are never going to be any better as a team than you are as a leader. Let that sink in for a sec. They're never going to be any better as a team than you are as a leader. And when your team lacks the commitment to take ownership, the task at hand for you as a manager moving to be a great leader is to foster a culture where each team member feels responsible and empowered to contribute significantly to the cause. That's the ticket. But what's the technique or leadership practice you have to change in yourself to achieve that change in your team? Let's start with the first big misstep. I see it almost every time a team is coming up short, not bought in, certainly not committed. And that's the power of why. The power of why is the drive to change and internally with them the purpose that they must possess to own their responsibilities. A critical element that is often overlooked in team management. Explaining why. And that's the first thing you need to always consider. Put it in your toolbox and start practicing this right away. Because when you're asking your team to achieve a goal, make a change, commit to some kind of project, they must understand why this is so important or why we're fixing this problem or why this is so crucial. Understanding the why behind the need for change or actions not only provides clarity, but it significantly boosts motivation and engagement with your team members. You may know why. We're going to talk about that in a minute. You must convey that to them. They're not going to just do it because you ask them to. So the first step, if you're taking direction from your boss, it's essential that you fully understand the why Ugh. behind the change or the importance of the project. What is the why? What is the importance of this? Why are we making this change? You must know. And if you don't know it, you need to own that. You cannot confidently transfer ownership from the boss to you to them if you don't understand or committed to the why, you come across as a weak leader and speak up, ask questions. Then you'll start making a difference. Being a team player 
doesn't mean blindly accepting every task that comes your way from above. And in fact, you have the responsibility and power to shape the conversation with your boss and with your team that will make a much more meaningful impact on both. Don't be afraid to voice your thoughts. Ask those important questions. You may be shedding some light on any obstacles that your boss may not be aware of. You want to see clarity. You want to be fully educated and personally bought in. You can't achieve this unless you ask questions. Maybe even push back every now and then if something's not making sense to you. And by doing so, you're helping yourself establish that why, the commitment to the why. You may open some doors for your boss, but certainly you're going to be much more prepared to discuss the why with your team. If you just say yes to everything, you're just going to be continued, pushed into commitments that you're responsible for and your team's not going to be committed to. Why? Because you're not truly committed. You don't understand and embrace the why. And your team almost certainly will come up short of expectations. It's that transference of knowledge, that transference of commitment. That's what leadership is. And that's what leads to all this frustration, why they don't do what you tell them to do. Why they lack that ownership. Because you're just doing what you're told to do. And again, that's weak. Step up, take control, ask questions. Who, what, why, when, how, where? And be the catalyst for positive change in your team. You must gain clarity, speak your opinion in a respectful way, and be more proficient at critical thinking. This will help you exercise that muscle, maybe even your boss's muscle. And you're going to reap some huge rewards because now you're going to be fully engaged. Again, that transference down to your team. And even if you're disagreeing with what needs to be done, what you're being asked to do, you're still going to need to go get your team bought into it. And if you don't ask those questions, at least you have, you must ask those questions so that when your team asks, you can respond with what your knowledge is. But that's one of those company things that please state your case, get your points in. And if not, you're not fully agreeing with this, you may be wrong, by the way, until you get dug into it. But you need to understand the whys because your team's going to ask you. I'm not sure is never the answer. Know the why. And by the way, I'll put my link to my critical thinking cheat sheet in the show notes. If you want to start practicing asking these important questions, both of your boss, your peers, and especially your team. It's one of the most powerful tools you're going to have. Now, <clears throat> And I apologize, I'm just getting over some bronchitis. I'm sure I sound very scratchy today. The next step is the importance of explaining the why. This cannot be overstated. It is a powerful tool that not only clarifies the need for change, but also actively engages and motivates your team. And as a leader, make it a priority. Make it a priority to communicate the why behind every significant decision or change or goal. Because this will not only enhance the effectiveness of your team, but it'll also contribute to you being a much more dynamic leader, which will then contribute more to your company. The transformational triangle of change. And I've seen this explanation of why flip negative motivation to positive motivation like that. 
negative attitude to positive attitude like that. Just as soon as the why is introduced into the narrative. Understand as humans, we have a deep seated resistance to change. And just because you're the boss and just because you ask is not a significant reason to change anything. Resistance to change is often rooted in the lack of understanding. So by you clearly articulating the why, you can address their uncertainties, their fears, and that makes it easier for your team members to embrace change and move forward as a team collectively. And you always have to keep in mind with this why issue, you're always managing perceptions. And this step of explaining why controls and informs their internal narrative. And any dogma that they may possess dissipates. So I cannot overstress it. I've gone into some level of detail on it. Work on, possess the why. Next step, understand the why. I've got to go start communicating this to my team. We've got to go get it done. So I need to huddle up. Let's get after it. Go to your team. Introduce to them the problem or objective or goal. And to do that effectively, you huddle up with your team. Don't make the mistake of only including a few key members. Bring them all in. Get them all in there and then explain the problem, explain the change, explain the objective in clarity, including the why. And once they understand the reason, the need, the importance of the change, what's behind the scenes, we're going to get into that in just a second. When they understand the reasons behind a change or a goal, You've got another notch up to the performance commitment. They're much more likely to align their efforts with the objective. This understanding helps them see the bigger picture, gets rid of any of these internal narratives that they have, their perceptions. Now they're much more likely to contribute and understand how their contributions fit in to achieving this. And one of the things you have to make sure that you understand as part of the problem explanation is them understanding the stakes or the consequences of not achieving this goal or making this change or getting this project accomplished. And as business owners or managers, you know that achieving our goals and making changes can have enormous benefits to the team, the organization, to us. But your team is going to have to be aware of this too, the consequences. Now, consequences often are associated with personal consequences. This is really broader consequences, team, company consequences, customer consequences. Sometimes they may fail to consider the stakes or the consequences when you're asking for a change or a new goal. You must share how these consequences can have a lasting impact on them, you, the company. But first, you must understand those. That comes back to understanding the why. You've got to ask the questions. You must understand this clearly. It's crucial. What does that entail? As you're talking with your team, before you take any action, before you implement any, execute any of the steps to achieve the goal, it's crucial that you identify what's going to go wrong. If you don't make this change, what's the potential risk? How's this going to affect your business? How's it going to affect them? Because that's going to help you plan their actions, them plan their actions. They need to understand these risks. And you need to be open and honest, transparent with your team about any potential outcomes if the goal is not achieved. 
or the change is not implemented. They've got to understand the stakes. This truly helps with the buy-in tremendously. You've got to hit on the impact for them and the company. And you also may need to acknowledge your role. What am I going to do as part of this? Or maybe how did you contribute to the challenge? How you may be or they may be part of the issue. How they contributed to the problem. Likely unaware they wouldn't be doing it. Honest and transparent. But especially if you have a part in it, own it. It's a very important dynamic first step. Now, you understand the why, you've conveyed that to them. They understand the problem. They understand the consequences. They understand what they need to go, what the goal is. How are we going to get the goal accomplished? How are we going to make this change? How are we going to create a solution to this? Collaborate. The path to exceptional execution as a leader lies in collaboration. Something else I can't stress enough. Game changer, folks. Engage your team in the problem-solving process. Gain their insights. Gain their experiences. It's invaluable. And this approach not only leads to more effective solutions, but also ensures team buy-in. Now, let's get this out of the way. You probably have the solution or been told the solution. This is what you need to go do. The trick to all this, now you've got to get them to want to go do it. And you can't just tell them they're not likely to be bought in if you just tell them to do it. So I've got to draw it out of them. How do I do that? Your boss may be the smartest guy in the room. You may be the smartest person in the room, but you're, neither one of you are smarter than the room. They're the ones that have to go achieve this. They're the ones that have the experiential knowledge. They have opinions. They have thoughts. They have solutions that often go untouched. And this whole collaborative framework begins setting a clear path to a solution that establishes buy-in. So you explain the issue at hand, you explain the goal, and then start gaining from them what they believe is going to take to achieve that goal. This sets the stage. This sets the stage. And again, not being the smarter than the room, you're going to be able to get all these diverse ideas. You start generating all this collaboration and thought, things that likely maybe small details, sometimes big details, that hasn't been considered above or from you. But regardless, you need to listen to their opinions. You need to get their uh, ideas. That's the trick to all this. Have them com contribute to the solution, and they're much more likely to commit to the solution. And so your collaborative meetings is a brainstorming session where ideas are welcomed. There's no judgment. There's no criticism that's involved in with that. We're just getting ideas. We're just getting thoughts. We're writing those down. So we're considering those. We're discussing those as a team. And you must be the leader that emphasizes that every suggestion is valuable and will be considered. Considered, not implemented. What are some of the tools you can use in these collaborative sessions? There's whiteboards, there's post-it notes. Digital whiteboards, if you're doing it uh, uh, virtually, uh, suggestion boxes, have people write down and send in suggestions. Think about ways to get people to be vocal and involved in these meetings. We'll talk about this a little bit more later because you're going to have some people that are very quiet in this room. They're not used to this approach. 
You've got to get them into the game with you. And we're going to talk about how you do that in just a few seconds, minutes. But you need to have this structured discussion, maybe sometimes debate. It's okay to disagree. It's healthy debate. It's respectful debate. But an organized discussion where ideas are explored, they're debated, they're talked about. And you can do this in round tables. You can do this virtually. You can do it in several small groups. I always suggest you get everybody together, but if that's not possible, do it in multiple round tables. But get everybody involved. Everybody needs to be contributing their ideas, thoughts, suggestions, opinions. And then as you have gathered all this information, it's on the whiteboard, it's on the flip chart, it's wherever you're capturing this, integrate them, get them all together, gather all the ideas and work with your team to synthesize, to distill these ideas and thoughts. And that's where some of the ones that aren't so important will get removed by the group, not by you. But it needs to be transparent. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be transparent. Everybody's in, in the pool. And that the elements sometimes of different suggestions, it may not be the full suggestion, but elements of a suggestion get brought into the final plan. This is negotiation, if you will. But in the end, we're going to have to come up with a way that everybody has agreed to. And the best way to do that is to, to vote. Have everybody say, yes, I like that idea. I don't like that idea. Then let the group, not you, not your boss, let the group decide the consensus of what we're going to go do to achieve this. How we're going to come up with our final solution that they're committed to. It's democratic. And if you give every member a sense of participation, much higher level of buy-in. And make sure that during the course of these discussions, ask your team, okay, what's going to go wrong? What's going to blow up on us? So that we're discussing that. Now, you're going to have to practice this. You're going to have to do this about 20 times to get really good at it. But every journey starts with the first step. Begin with these first initial steps I talked about. And in your initial engaging with this sort of thing, you're not going to capture it all. Even further down the road, you're, things are going to come up that you didn't anticipate. And sometimes you're going to have to give your team members some time to think about it, maybe regroup, have a redistillation of their ideas to make sure this solution is a really good solution and that they're committed to it. And there's somebody listening to this podcast who says, come on, I don't have time for this going to take way too long. Yeah. It takes longer. But you're going to be avoiding delays. You're going to be avoiding making changes. You're going to be avoiding making mistakes. They're going to all slow you down later. And if you don't slow it down in the beginning, you're going to slow down later. And if you don't slow it down and get their commitment through their collaboration in the beginning, you're going to slow down later because you don't have their commitment. They're not going to follow through with their, their heads and hearts. So you want to make sure you implement the change or solution one time. Always keeping in mind that no matter what business you're in the people business, and this is the heart and soul of the people business. Now, if you're new to collaborative discussions, which you likely are, collaborative problem solving, 
you're going to have the quiet voices in the room. You know the ones I'm talking about. Any team, there's a diversity of personalities, certainly communication styles. And according to DISC, the DISC Behavior Assessment, a significant portion of the population, nearly 70%, falls under the high S or stability category, safety category. And these individuals are typically more reserved and not likely to readily share their thoughts or their opinions. However, their insights can be invaluable. And it's not, does anybody have any questions? That's the worst approach ever because they're always going to not have any questions. They're not going to have any contribution. So here's how you can effectively draw out their ideas. These quiet, these people that don't contribute much. Remember, everybody has to contribute. Here's how you effectively draw their ideas and suggestions out. Foundationally. You have to have an environment that's safe and inclusive. So you're going to have to repeat this a few times. You need to start fostering a team culture where every voice is valued. You need to make sure your team understands that you emphasize that every team member's input is not only welcome, but essential for the team's success. These high S's are all about the team's success. That's where you can hook them into contributing. But it has to be a safe space for your quieter members because they're non-confrontational. They're not likely to speak up. So it has to be safe for them to speak up. And how do I get them to do that? Ask open-ended questions. It's the most powerful tool on the planet to do this. Like I mentioned earlier, who, what, where, when, how, why. Avoid the closed-ended questions. How are we going to get this done? What's going to get in our way? Who's going to be the most person, the, the person who's most likely to get this done? What's going to go wrong? When should we start this? When should we finish this? As that's going to prompt them contributing to all this. What are your thoughts on this project? What are your thoughts on this strategy? How, how do you think we can improve this? You can't accept silence as an answer, but you can't yell at anybody either. So it's crucial that it's safe. And the more you do it, the safer it will become. And when they do contribute, and it may just be one time early on, you need to acknowledge that. You need to validate that. When they share their idea or suggestion, make sure you reward them for that. Just with your words, your validation to their contribution boosts their confidence that encourages them to participate later on. Reward the behaviors you seek. The other thing you have to keep in mind is leading by example. You must demonstrate active listening. So as they're giving you information, you need to acknowledge, write it down, pay attention to it, show genuine interest. You can't judge them. You can't dismiss them. You can't, yeah, but them bring it all in control yourself control your response control your need to just get this done that's an enemy because when you become much more effective at active listening as a leader it sets the precedent for the rest of your team to follow they're going to more likely actively listen to each other too Walk in the talk. And this way you can ensure that the quieter members of the team begin to feel heard and valued 
It's going to motivate them to participate more. And that enhances your team's collaboration and creativity. Now I'm getting all the information into the pool of collective knowledge. That's powerful. So collaboration, get those quiet members into the game with you. We've agreed, we've voted on the solution, how we're going to go approach this. It's time to assign roles and responsibilities. So once your solution is agreed upon, you need to start assigning members different parts of the responsibility. It needs to align with their strengths, it needs to align with their interests as much as possible. This alignment, putting the right butt in the right seat, aligns and further enhances that sense of ownership and commitment. Because you want to enhance that commitment. That's the ownership. Now I'm committed to this. When they're committed to this course of action is when they start really understanding and getting purpose. I've explained the why, the consequences. I participated in how we're going to go solve this. This all adds up to their deeper commitment and motivation to accept the task, accept the challenge, participate wholeheartedly in it. This encourages their ownership. This encourages their accountability. To keep all that in mind, it transforms their perspectives from merely following instructions to actively participating in the solution. It's a huge mind shift, but it's crucial for fostering this culture of accountability and ownership. And now it's time. I've made my assignments. I've got the solution. Everybody understands why everybody's bought in. I got to go implement it. You need to lead it. You need to implement it and realize you're going to have to adapt to some challenges that come along too. Your role is now to guide execution. You must stay actively involved. You must monitor progress. You must be ready to adjust as needed. Regular team check-ins, open forums, Open meetings for feedback, all essential. And it's really important that they've got something measurable, some KPI, if you will, to track their progress. And also keep in mind, especially if you have some personal doubt on, on your based on your own experience, that there's a potential setback or a negative outcome, keep that in mind and know what you're going to do when it shows itself. Hopefully it doesn't, but it's important to have the framework in place and be prepared to pivot if necessary. When you know what you're going to do when something starts failing, I don't miss a lot of steps. I can recognize it, make the change, keep moving. It'll give you some peace of mind. And when you see the, the problem appearing, act swiftly. The worst thing you can do is sit back and watch it as negative things start happening. You notice a problem arising from your plan, from your execution, act swiftly to address it. Don't just cross your fingers and hope the problem goes away. It won't. Maybe re-collaborate with your team. But... You must assess, adapt, and overcome. Monitor and measure. Regular updates. And early wins are huge. Celebrate those early wins. The underlying part of everything I've talked about today to take this first step to lead a highly committed, high-performing team is communication. That's generally the gap in management You're as you're moving to a 
high performing leader yourself. It's the pitfall that many accidental managers, maybe that's you, is you just have not been educated on effective communication skills. And that gap can lead to a lot of misunderstandings, misalignment, missed goals, lack of direction, lack of commitment, which is what we're talking about today. And to bridge that gap, keep in mind, you're always working on your communication skills. You need to adopt a clear, concise, consistent communication approach, especially in your meetings. The one thing that will guide you into higher levels of achievement, collaboration, open discussions in your meetings. Please make your meetings a dialogue, not a monologue. Make sure your team members understand it's everybody's meeting, not just your meeting. It's everybody's role to achieve the goal, to achieve the mission, to contribute to the success of the team and the organization. Effective leadership is much more than just oversight. It's empowerment for your team to take ownership of their roles, but you have to involve them in the problem solving process. You must lead by example, celebrate successes as they come along. And this creates an environment that's conducive to growth, success, commitment, motivation, ownership. Embrace your role. Understand it's going to take some practice, deliberate practice on your part, and you're going to not be very good in the beginning. Learn from that. Get back in the game. Embrace your failure. You're going to have some missteps. Okay, whoops. Get back in it again. And if you take this collaborative approach to problem solving and implementing the changes I've talked about today, you're going to start leading the most high performing team you've ever imagined. It cultivates all these diverse perspectives. It leads them to more innovative solutions. It strengthens your team's cohesion and trust in you and the, com and the company. It also enhances the team's adaptability, their own communication skills. You're developing them. They love to be developed. They love to be learned. Everybody does. Did I just say learned? Taught. Jeez. Overall, this collaborative strategy is instrumental in driving both immediate project success, goal achievement, and long-term organizational growth. And once again, yes, you may be the smartest person in the room, but you're not smarter than the room. So please keep that in mind. 